Hi, Nikita. Hey, Bob. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. How are you? I can't complain. Let me introduce this. Uh, I'm Robert Wright, publisher of the Non-Zero Newsletter. This is the Non-Zero Podcast. You're Nikita Petrov, publisher of the Psychopolitica Newsletter on the Substack platform. I noticed there happens to be a sign immediately behind you within camera view, as it happens, as it turns out, as fate would have it, that has the name of your newsletter on it. Might get cut out on the split screen. I think you've made that almost impossible. I congratulate you on your, I mean, it's going to be hard. Uh, I congratulate you on your product placement. Um, so Thank you. you used to be a resident of St. Petersburg. Now you're a resident of somewhere outside of Russia, as you have been, uh, well, since the invasion, more or less. You made one foray back into Russia in the meanwhile. Uh, but you're, what, what country are you in now? Uh, currently in Armenia, mm -hmm. capital city Yerevan, but I might end up in Europe before the end of the year. I got uh, uh, a my, what is it called? Application for a nomad visa, it's called in Spain, got approved. Still need to go through some uh, circles of bureaucracy, but before the end of the year, I should be in Spain. That's the most exotic name I've ever heard for a visa, a nomad visa. A nomad visa. This is the idea is this is given to people who have jobs outside of the country that mm -hmm. they are for remote workers. So it's like you have enough money to uh, sustain yourself. You pay taxes in the country where you're applying for, but you don't compete with the local population for work. I see. Because you have a contract with an outside, like you're not allowed to work within Spain. I see. I think I, see. I think you can. I think you can if it's like not no more than twenty percent of your income is coming from Spain itself. Okay. Well. Uh, cool. So that would that would uh, yeah. You speak Spanish? I do not, but I think it's much easier to learn than Armenian. Uh, uh, but Probably the main so. thing, the main thing about this is. Uh, it allows it's given out for three years and uh any you know residents in any of the eu countries opens up the eu for you mm -hmm. uh which for rush a russian these days uh you know just crossing the border is difficult like the the ability to travel to go from one place to another is a pretty important ability i'll bet so yeah I will say about Spanish, by the way, the pronunciation is very it's simple uh, when you're I mean, it, it's with English. You cannot tell to see the words on the printed page, how you're supposed right. to pronounce them necessarily with Spanish. It is so straightforward. It's wonderful. Right. There, there's almost no doubt ever. It, it's just there's rules and they work. That's my kind of language. <laughs> And with your um, meaning, there's a whole different alphabet with too many uh, uh, letters in it. Uh, uh, and, and the words, it's the words just don't intuitively like I if I try to remember a word, like I start repeating it to myself and I try to keep it in my mind. Still, I forget it the next day unless I really, really, you know, like day after day. And with Spanish, I was there for, you know, a couple of weeks when I was applying for the visa. And it seemed like you can just start picking it up pretty yeah. easily. Yeah, it's uh, it's 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 pretty straightforward. Um, so, uh, you are a. Do you call yourself a Russian expatriate or? or I, that I doesn't mean, by the way, that you're no longer a patriot. It, 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 it in English, it just means you're kind of abroad or something. That's what they. No, I that's know what they the called word. Hemingway when he was in Europe. I think. Yeah, I don't know if I'm a patriot or not either. Uh, I don't have uh, the the word that's used here is used to be used uh, relocant, like a person who was re relocated because a lot of the people who moved uh, it's like business whole businesses mo were moved, like uh, a company moved all of its staff somewhere to Armenia or Georgia, and so this word appeared relocant. Mm -hmm. uh, but I don't I don't have an identification that I use myself. Okay, well, we're going to talk uh, largely about things in Russia uh, and your take on things in Russia, uh, observing them 
from abroad, since you still have reason to care about them. Uh, you still have family there and and you lived there for almost all your life and so on. I guess it's natural that we start, since we're taping this on the day after a plane went down that apparently uh, included Evgeny Prigozhin, the, the head of uh, the Wagner Group, Along with his top commander, the guy, the guy after whom from whom the Wagner group got its name. Wagner was his call sign. Yeah. Um, and I actually haven't even looked at the news this morning, but it didn't seem to me there was that much doubt, even though they hadn't identified bodies or anything. Uh, I assume no one's doubting uh, that he's. That well, there are two two main theories that I've been hearing. The one is the straightforward one. Mm -hmm. Prigozhin and the top command are dead and it's, you know, Putin is behind it. Uh, the other version is this is Prigozhin's disappearance. This is, mm -hmm. he's somewhere on an island right now drinking a martini and this is his way out of the business, which normally I would say like there's no reason whatsoever to contemplate that approach. But since this is Prigozhin and we've seen like six fake passports of his with toupees and beards and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And generally he's, you know, a peculiar character. He's like fighting in Africa and then he's in Ukraine and he also has a catering business and the troll farm. I, I think that's not a zero chance probability, but I don't think it's a high chance probability either. On the other hand, yeah, Russia has always been a hotbed for this kind of theorizing, right? Yes, yes. So uh, there's a That's pretty normal, high... normal thing for Russians to whatever happens, there's always a conspiracy theory right away. So there's pretty, pretty high false positive rate on conspiracy theories in Russia and increasingly in America. It's maybe this can bring the two nations together that, that we have this in common at, after this war. I think there is some overlap. I mean, before the war, there was, I think, kind of a growing, uh, you know, there are tribes within Russia and the U.S. who were uh growing closer together like the QAnon people and uh you know there's hmm. even with the war there's a Wait, little did, bit what, like what? yeah that that kind of makes sense actually yeah uh, go ahead even with, I, I was surprised to um there was a few weeks ago or maybe you know a month and a half or something ago uh RFK got into that scandal because he said that COVID he said something about COVID. The, the way his words were inter interpreted is there is a chance that, uh, you know, it was designed by the Chinese in the lab and it targets certain groups more than others. Right. And he started talking about bioweapons and, and whatnot. And uh, that is like a part of the Russian. I think he talked about bioweapons, uh, bio labs think, in I Ukraine so. even. Yeah, and that's the a bio, thing. That's a that's a talking point. Yeah, and biolabs in Ukraine. I until then I was not aware that anybody in the West thinks that. Uh, but it was a big, big part of the Russian propaganda. Uh, well, some versions of which are very strange. And even the the basic idea that there are these. So on the one hand, Russians, according to the Russian propaganda, Russian state propaganda, the Russians and Ukrainians are really the same people, but also there are bio labs in Ukraine that were designing viruses that would target specifically Russians. It's a Which very discerning virus. It picks up on this, the most subtle differences in DNA. But there was a funny moment um, about a year ago or something, Victoria Newland this of course she's in this she's now the number two person at the state department acting deputy and uh she's presumably somewhat notorious in some russian circles for having been the woman who passed out cookies to the protesters on the maidan prior to the overthrow you know leading up to the overthrow of uh was it yanukovych is that the name of the ousted yes. president yep. of ukraine and uh she was testifying like before congress and they a congressman asked her about these supposed biolabs, I think expecting that she would dismiss them completely. And her wording emphatically did not dismiss the idea completely. It was a very strange moment. She she mm -hmm. she she spoke carefully. Um now you can imagine all kinds of relatively innocent bio collaborative biolabs things, I guess you do, although 
honestly, I don't know why the hell you do them in Ukraine. Uh, it, it, that's kind of weird, right? It's like Ukraine has never been, from our point of view, just an absolute pillar of stability, right? It's like, right. it's like, put it in France, put it in, like, why, why, if there, if there is such a thing, I don't know, people, I have no idea, I'm agnostic, and I certainly don't think that they were developing viruses that targeted Russians, but, um, uh, they were supposed to be carried over into Russia by birth yeah. of passage. That I suppose, the... I suppose one possibility is, you know, after the Soviet Union collapsed, there was an effort to uh, clean up various problematic weapons of mass destruction situations there. I had thought of them as mainly nuclear. We, of course, got the nukes out of Ukraine. Could be relate, could be some carryover from that era. Uh, you know, could have been initially Soviet. Who knows? I don't know. That's but but on uh, Prigozhin, um So, yeah, I mean, last. Well, well tell me, assuming. If you exclude the people who are thinking it might all be a fake by him, in in which case he presumably the theory is he actually feared something like this happening for real, right? I mean, he didn't he didn't feel safe in this world. Uh, Either that, or another version of the same theory would be that like he made a deal with Putin. This is how I'm gonna go out. You oh, know, and then you you'll was... look like you were the tough guy and did crack down. That's and right. I'll feel like I'm and not. I'll dead. get my pension and I'm fine. Yeah. Um, I've got a feeling he doesn't need a pension. <laughs> I, I think <laughs> a, I forget how many, uh, how much sure, in cash sure. was found in his apartment, but I suspect that he's got, right. he had stashes various places. But um, the, uh, so anyway, I assume that's a, your sense is not that you're in Russia, but your sense is that that's that will be a minority interpretation anyway that he's not actually dead. From what I've hear, heard so far, it's like most people say there's also this possibility. It's probably a low possibility. So I haven't met a true believer in this theory so far. I mean, it's been a day. Mm -hmm. It's been less than a day. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it's brought up and discussed as a low probability option like mm -hmm. and i mean we, we will never know i suppose because the bodies are burned like we're not going to see a picture of uh mm -hmm. prigozhin mm -hmm. that we can recognize and the people who will tell us uh, they might have already i saw some reports like that sounded more official than uh than what i saw last evening that yes this is prigozhin and utkin and uh the other passengers that were supposed to be on the plane the people who are going to tell us this are the authorities, which if they are the ones who decided to do this uh, staged disappearance, you know, you're not supposed to trust them. Right. But I don't think it matters, frankly. Like, I think it's a low probability uh, uh, version, and I don't think it matters because both options lead to Prigozhin not being here anymore. If he lives a private yeah. life on an island somewhere, uh, he that's seems his version of picture. Yeah, and, and and everyone else will uh, act on the assumption that Putin did it, and and that's my next that's question. Right. Among is your sense that among those Russians who do believe Rogozin's dead, overwhelmingly the assumption is Putin decided to take him out. Yes, yes. Yeah. I I can't even come up with another theory. I mean, of course, especially, I mean, has it been confirmed that uh, that there was an, an anti-aircraft missile fired at the plane, or is that still? No, I think they are saying now that uh, their main version is there was an explosive in the, I don't know the English word, I'm not sure, chassis, is that a word? The wheel of the plane. Ah. Uh, uh, and they that... say they have uh, a suspect which is Prigozhin's private pilot, who like was supposed to be on the flight maybe, or at least was able to access the plane and his MIA somewhere. Uh, some friend of his said that he's uh, tracking in Siberia or something along those lines. So they have like a suspect and a theory that doesn't go further than that guy so far. Like why would his pilot do this? But I think that my become the official narrative. This is what I'm 
uh, I see in this morning. So you, uh, we had a slight bandwidth issue, and I missed something. So is it confirmed that the pilot is um, is in fact uh, was not on the plane, the regular pilot? Oh, that's just being speculated. yes. I, th I, I think confirmed? it's not. I, huh. I think he's he, he was called uh, Prigozhin's private pilot. So I'm not sure he was supposed to be on this plane. It's just he flew with Prigozhin before. I see. Uh, and so they are singling him out as a suspect. Um, do you think? But Putin I mean, would, what does that? Do you think I, Putin I don't would think go to the, do, you, do you think Putin would go to the trouble to like frame somebody and do the whole court proceeding and put them in prison? Or I mean, it's weird because clearly. I mean, presumably Putin wants a, a certain crowd to know he did it, like including possibly much of the world, right? He wants he wants some people to think, yeah, Putin cracked down. Let's don't plot any mutinies anytime soon. Um, and, and I'm not sure if there's anyone. I mean, that's the thing about this. It's so blatant, right? With, with most, with, with some of the past assassinations attributed to Putin, it wasn't rock solid evidence. And in fact, I would run into smart uh, people who paid attention. I'd say, what do you think the chances are that this guy was taken out by Putin? They'd say, well, probably or 90% or 95%. I don't think you're going to hear many people as low as 95% on this one. It seems like this time it was just like, right, it's more it's a more unabashed assassination. I think that's true, but also nobody tried to you know, take his private army and march right, from Moscow right, before. Right, absolutely. I mean, I think, yeah, I, I and of course, Putin had been, uh, you know, this had been, you know, the uh, American Russia hawks like Michael McFall had said right after this happened, right after the mutiny, and then the deal was negotiated. McFall said, "See." All this stuff about how Putin, if you corner him, is dangerous, is mm -hmm. wrong. We don't need to worry about pushing them out of Crimea and back into Russia. And e and I assume even what is happening now, which is actually attacks on uh, Russian territory. Uh, and McF anyway, McFall said, um, uh, you know, so this just shows he'll fold. He'll, 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 it's a bluff. And first of all, at the time, I said, well, well what McFall said is he capitulated. And first of all, I pointed out, he did not capitulate. He didn't meet Prigozhin's demands. That's capitulation. It's like if you do fire right. Shoigu and Gerasimov, the two like military chiefs that uh, were fired. Uh, but in any event, I also thought, like, given... I I'd be interested in your take on this. Because I thought that, leave aside the fact that uh, apparently, ultimately, uh, Prigozhin paid the ultimate price. Um, I thought, given the situation Putin was in... He didn't handle it that bad. I mean, you got 5,000 troops mar marching to Moscow. Things could get seriously out of hand, even if you're confident you can put it down. Uh, these people are considered war heroes by a lot of Russians, right? They're the guys who, who did Bakhmut. They're, they have a base. And uh, I thought to get out of that with, uh, you know, after once they had uh, Wagner and shot down the planes and killed, to get out of it after that with no further bloodshed, uh, I didn't think that was what what did you think of the way uh leaving aside the fact that ultimately Putin had it both ways? He finessed it without a big confrontation and got Prigozhin killed. Uh leave the Prigozhin killing aside. What did you think after the event? Well, first of all, the the event itself and a few days after, the prevalent feeling uh, among all the Russians I know, whether inside of our side Russia, is just how bizarre this whole thing is. Especially like as the events were unfolding, like you started to march, you started to get these audio messages. This is how you get updates in Telegram from Prigozhin himself. And then you try to figure out for a while, it wasn't clear whether this is actually happening or not. Like he's saying that they're marching on the Rostov at the time, and like, is he? I haven't seen any pictures. It's just Prigozhin saying that he's known for, you know, playing games. Mm -hmm. uh, and then suddenly, shit, there are tanks in Rostov. And then he's saying he's marching on Moscow. And then uh, my brother was in Moscow at the time, and he went into the streets, and he said it was a weird, weird feeling that 
haven't been there for a long time, that the cops and the people are on the same side because the cops in Moscow and people in Moscow were like expecting this fucking army to show up. Yeah. And the cops seemed nervous and unsure what to do. And so, and then Lukashenko appears out of nowhere and saves the situation. And the next day he, he delivers this. He's the, Bel the Belarus uh, president who supposedly, I mean, was involved, but supposedly he, he makes it sound like his initiative. Who knows exactly? But, but go ahead. He is, yeah. His, his press conference is one of my favorite things that happened this year because just the <laughs> style in which he talks about it is like, you know, and this guy is a hothead and Putin says, listen, I can't call him. He's not picking up the phone. And I go, well, do you have his number? Let me call him. <laughs> FSB probably has it. And then it's another half hour before they find the number. And then I call him and I say, Zhenya, you can't, it's just yeah. as if he's talking about some, uh, you know, something happening in the, uh, his gardening community, the two neighbors got into a fight. Yeah. Um, um so, so the, the prevalent feeling of, from this whole experience is just like, this is bizarre and weird. And, um, and the analysis, when and the analysis started to come in like three days in after the, the thing, four days after the thing, I had this feeling of, like maybe this is us trying to pretend that we understand what is going on because these these couple of days nobody nobody knew what is happening. Every theory was thrown out there, whether it's staged, whether it's real, whether it's uh, you've heard these. You know, Prigozhin agreed with Putin that he's mm -hmm. going to do this thing to find the people who are actually not loyal enough. There is like all of this and nobody had a good theory because the straightforward one seemed also too weird. Um, yeah. But, but now in the aftermath, uh, I think I agree with you in that Putin did not lose control. And now, you know, he's like, this is a pretty, the Russian word they use signal. This is a strong signal that he's sending that if you, <laughs> if you try to do this, you're going to blow up. Um, but uh, I think a lot of people did feel as this was happening, surely, that this is not the behavior of a strong leader because he was nowhere to be found. Like on the day, it was like Piskov, his spokesperson said that Putin has been, like he knows about the situation. Mm -hmm. and but, but that was all. And then in the morning, he uh, made this speech um, and, and during the day, like, as again, this was happening, there weren't a lot of people who really jumped in front of the situation and said, I support the president of my country and this is mutiny. You know, they started saying that as the situation progressed and became more clear that this is what you're supposed to be doing. But I don't see any of those things as really huge losses, uh, for Putin you know, there is no, th there was no serious uh, bloodshed. There were, mm -hmm. some people did die, about 10 people, I think. And uh, there was like a, a few helicopters in a plane that got shut down. Uh, but more or less, you know, in two days, the situation is over. Putin is still the president. Now two months in, Prigozhin's dead. So, so I don't see you... how he's a weaker person. Right. Uh, I was going to ask, I mean, you, I know you don't think of yourself as primarily a political analyst, but the sense of some people here is Putin is now stronger than ever. And people should, uh, Westerners should start abandoning their hope that the regime is going to collapse. I mean, I never thought it was smart to hope for that anyway, given the various kinds of catastrophes, uh, in, including, uh, ones that go beyond your borders, the various kinds of catastrophes regime implosion can lead to but uh like ongoing civil war and so on but uh but the people who had hoped for that as as some kind of shortcut to ukrainian victory um are i i think some of them are, are now reconsidering uh some are who knows i i haven't checked out the landscape i don't know yet what michael mcfall is saying but I, um 
I know um, one columnist in in the Post, uh, Washington Post, kind of former neocon said, uh, or uh, uh, whatever he said, uh, Max Boot said he thought uh, you might as well assume the regime is strong. That's that's kind of it's kind of your sense. It sounds like I think so. I I don't see who would who would try to replace Putin. Who would try to stage a coup? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, as for the theories of what was going on with Prigozhin, I mean, I remember I was paying a lot of attention to it early on, you know, like months before the big, uh, the mutiny, you know, he was starting to do these videos where he was getting a little uppity, right? Mm -hmm. And, like, it seems like you're creating more trouble than the president of your country wants you to create, right? And then it got, as the as the mutiny approached, it got more and more extreme. And then he started saying things like, wait, was that a reference to Putin? When he says, I forget that there's right. a term, grandpa or something. And he right, and he right. clarifies and says, no, no, that was either Shoigu or Gerasimov. Shoigu, the Ministry of Defense, Gerasimov, the head of the military campaign. Um, uh, but it was getting so weird. And I started saying, like, is he mentally unstable? And then I just thought, well, He's obviously extremely not risk averse. I mean, he was, remember, he was a street criminal. He did like many years in prison. I mean, you know, Correct. criminals are famously not risk averse, you know, Correct. and and he had. And he actually goes to these war zones in which his people are fighting where right. he used to go. Yeah. Right. So what's your what's your theory of Prigozhin like kind of what exactly it, there, it's also a fact. I mean, there's, there was friction to say the least between him and the military command which we could get into but but what's your uh, which might give him more in the way of a plausible motivation for this than we really understand you know but what is your what is your theory of Prigozhin and how he kind of unwound and the mutiny happened yeah so again you have to preface this with saying i'm not sure of anything um but and that, like at the time when before the mutiny, when he started to make these political statements and started within Russia, he traveled, he did a little tour and talked to people and posted these videos uh, where he sounded like, you know, the oppositional politician. He was, uh, and the charismatic one, truth teller, mm -hmm. and he's mm -hmm. just from the war. There was a lot of appeal there. Uh, and at that time, I don't, I, I think most like the this like taking it for uh, taking it at face value versus a conspiratorial version of some some kind. The conspiracy version was higher than it is now. Obviously, uh, like people thought this is uh, Putin's friend giving him a favor. Like he's going to be the next puppet uh, opposition. Like the people who are tired of this war, people who are upset with the government for not being effective in this war. Uh, he like he had a lot of these critiques for different kinds of groups. Like if you were anti-war to begin with, he had a line for that. This war mean, shouldn't have started. Right. Uh, but then since we already started and we're in this mess, uh, we have to do it properly so this is for the kind of russians with attitudes type people that right. more effort should be put into the war so he had uh different kinds of appeal for different groups of people and the thinking then uh among many was again it was like nobody was really really sure but uh it was a common thought that this is uh he's going to be like the sparring partner uh for putin so people who are upset will be able to have this guy as their icon but he's totally controlled by putin so it's a safe valve yeah. um and now it doesn't look so much when no. it start stopped looking so much about the time he entered rostov i think well even before uh, then it, it didn't make sense to me that putin was happy with this because when he said uh look the, the uh the war was started under false pretenses because the military people fed Putin false information about whatever, how much of a threat Ukraine posed or something. Okay, technically he's letting Putin off the hook for starting the war, but 
it just doesn't look good for a president to be dupable that's in true. that way, right? That's, that's just yeah. not, that's just, there's, I just couldn't see any way Putin was welcoming yeah. uh, that unless, I, I guess one reason I couldn't is because I didn't really see any chance that Putin was close to saying, you know, this whole thing was a mistake, <laughs> you know, and, and so and that just, to me, that's when I really started to think, man, this guy is is playing with fire. Uh, and I do not understand whether he's crazy or what, but... Right. My sense at the time was that he was playing uh, his own game. I couldn't understand what the game was. Uh, but I thought that he's going to try to like make these moves within the parameters that he thought he's permitted to do. Mm -hmm. So it's like risky, but he's consciously trying to, uh, you know, not not do too risky. Yeah. Uh, and then obviously mutiny is a little, uh, you know, step too far. Uh, my theory, or it's not my theory, it's uh, what I have collected from, you know, reading stuff online is... Uh, he was supposed to, so the decision was made that Wagner is going to be disbanded. And uh, then the soldiers within it on an individual basis or as a group will be transferred under the control of the armed forces. Mm -hmm. And he did not like that. And this mutiny was his way of negotiating. And I think he didn't think it through, basically. Yeah. I think he didn't think that he would go that far. He would be able to so easily go that far. And then... When he did, I think he was hoping for Putin to say something different from what he said, which, you know, he compared it to uh, the revolution. And this is, uh, we're on the brink of civil war because of this kind of thing. So we need to protect the country and, and all that. Uh, so that's, that's my theory, that he was given a deadline like this, your career uh, is going to be over soon. And he thought, let me make this move and see. Uh, you know, raise, uh, raise the stakes and see what they reconsider. Yeah. And it may have been worse than that. I mean, he may have, act, it may have gotten to the point, I mean, partly through how audacious he had been, but it may have gotten to the point where he really thought uh, Shoiku and Garazimov were trying to kill him, which wouldn't shock me at all. He's in a war zone. It wouldn't be that hard to say, oh, it looks right. like a Ukrainian missile uh, took him out. Too bad. You know they wanted him dead at that point, right? Um, of course they wanted him dead. And so... He, when, he, when he was asked right after the mutiny, like, what was that? Why did you do that? He responded with one word that's kind of difficult to translate. Translate. He just said, psychanul, which is like, you know, I went over the board. Like, I, I was emotional, basically. I, I <laughs> went psycho for a moment. Just, what? What? You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, did you see the video that he he claimed documented a missile strike like by the Russian military against Wagner? Did you ever see right. that? That was pathetic. I mean, that yeah. was that 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 was so obviously fake, right? It was like he shows up. There's like a campfire there. It was like, it was like there was just it was like they had, they, had, they there was like a little fire. There was like no carnage, no destroyed equipment. There was there was like nothing. And then there was a little thing dug in the ground that definitely wasn't created by a missile. It wasn't round. It was like rectangulars. I mean, it was like it was it was so bad. And, and you know, one thing you mentioned Russians with attitude. I those are the two, you know, that's a podcast feed. They have a uh and I mean and uh, and a Twitter handle, these two Russians uh who are, you know, kind of nationalists, very pro-war. I had them on my podcast, as you know, and I, I want to get your reaction to that, but one thing one of them uh, said um, was that he thought uh, Prigozhin had been preparing this thing, assuming the Ukrainian offensive was going to succeed. This mm. was just as it was getting underway. And that was going to be and he was talking like that. He was he was uh, talking, almost predicting that. And he thought he was going to take advantage of that. Look, the military is in crisis. Uh, you know, they can't do the job. I can save us. And then that didn't happen. The Russian defenses didn't fold. And meanwhile, I think the theory may also be that the Russians caught wind or uh, the government and or the military caught wind of what Prigozhin was doing. So he had to act fast. 
because that video did not have the hallmarks. It did not have high production value. That was so obviously fake. I couldn't believe he put it out. Right. And that was uh, on that day. That was the one thing people were agreeing about. Like, this is definitely fake. And then the rest of it, we don't understand. Yeah. So um, uh, does is there any constituency in Russia? Uh, do you think within which it like hurts Putin that he assassinated this guy? I mean, there must be some people who don't approve. I'm sure there are kind of liberals right, in Russia a, who say this is no way to run a government, go around assassinating people all the time. But there's a distinction between uh, hurts Putin and like gets, you know, people shake their hands, heads about it. Right. Yeah. So the latter, sure, there are people who are upset about the president killing people left and right, and there's no rule of law or anything. But then these people have been upset for a long time. And then I think uh, there is some constituency who liked Prigozhin. I mean, when he came to Rostov, people were taking pictures with the uh, Wagner soldiers and uh, shaking their hands and hugging them. And, they're, you know, it wasn't like a mass rally where people were cheering them on, but there was no, you know, people were happy to hang out. Um, and when he started making those political statements, anecdotally, again, there's not like sociology that's serious that's being done in Russia. But I think even even with some of the polls that were being made, you, you saw his like rating rising. Uh, but I think he, uh, you know, there, there are people who liked him and who are upset that he's dead. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of them are in the Wagner group and are military trained and uh, have experience recently fighting the war. But my perception right now, I don't see how that hurts. I, I think Wagner is going to be dealt with. Uh, probably most of these people are going to serve in the army now mm -hmm. under, you know, contracts. The leadership, uh, like uh, Utkin, the, the guy who's uh, his nickname was Wagner, is dead too. So it's not like the Wagner soldiers themselves are going to be some kind of a political force. And then everybody else in Russia can think what they want to think. They're just not allowed to talk about it or do anything about it. Yeah. I mean, disapproving the, the... of Putin doesn't really get you anywhere. Uh, except possibly out of Russia, in your right. case. Um, the... Uh... Yeah, the the uh, what another thing actually I think Putin got by virtue of not immediately confronting uh ba Wagner Wagner was uh, during the mutiny was time to move control of it into his hands. It was a complicated it was a comp it's a complicated like international thing involving all these holding companies for there are all these companies and shit and I don't think anybody knew as well as Prigozhin did how it all worked. And I think Prigozhin probably had control, a lot of the key bank accounts. I mean, who knows? Uh, but I, I, I'm sure that one thing Putin did in the, uh, you know, in the, however long it's been, I guess, uh, what has it been, a couple of months? Um, is uh, it's, it's exactly two months. That's exactly another... Two, that's right. That's interesting. That's another yeah. thing that people bring up as a sign that this is Putin doing the thing because it's his style. Yeah. But I think he secured control of the Wagner operation, which is very important in places like Africa. Um, and for Russia, it's important. Um, Prigozhin yeah. was just in Africa a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yeah. And, okay. and you know, he filmed that he filmed that little video about how. So I'm make, you know, I'm making Russia even greater and all, mm -hmm. you know, all around the world. And in retrospect, you can wonder whether he was getting a little. He, he clearly saw he needed to rebrand as this this uh, dutiful servant of Putin's, but right, I guess it was right. a, the rebranding came possibly a little late. Um, right. The uh, um, what was I? Uh, oh, what was I going to ask? Um, well, let's. Oh, I was just going to note uh, the other thing that happened on the same day is, uh, you know, you had you had said that. Russian elites were a little slow to tape their little things about how they supported Putin. But one of the guys who did that the early, I think did it pretty early, right? Surovikin, this general who was 
friendly with Prigozhin, um, and a lot of people thought should be running the military operation is a more uh, is is a bet would be a better strategist and commander than Gerasimov, and in fact designed the whole defensive system that seems to be extremely formidable uh, that that uh, Ukraine is trying to overcome. Anyway, also on the day that uh, Prigozhin that the plane went down, I gather he was. Was he demoted or he had been still commander of the air operation or something? And he right, got, like either, I don't know if he was space. pushed out of the military entirely or what, but. I don't think we know his future fate, but he was removed from his position. And he did tape this, this video. Some people thought was a little odd fairly early on in the mutiny saying, come on, cut it out, Prigozhin, you know, blah, it blah, blah. It did seem weird though, the, the video it, to me, I mean, this is uh, just feeling, but but it was my feeling. I think a lot of a lot of people, other people uh, that I was talking to on that day, he sounded like he was told to do this now, mm -hmm. like like the higher ups told him, "You go do this." Yeah, um, I think that that day, I don't see the silence of these people as not being loyal, because. The loyalty that they have been uh, expressing to advance their political careers and the loyalty that I think Putin expects from his subjects is not to go out of their way to do what they feel is needed right now. They were mm -hmm. waiting for orders. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think there were people like if, if Putin, you know, told a general, anybody, you know, in the country, I need you to now publicly support me. I don't think that person would hesitate at that moment because Putin was still more fear, uh, fear, fearsome than, than Prigozhin at the time. Um, I think Putin was Biden time and trying to figure out what to do with the situation. And basically he did. I mean, to him, there is another, another thing that he did is he very clearly distinguished between Prigozhin, who he didn't call by name, like these people who are, you know, trying to do their evil things, and the uh, soldiers. Mm -hmm. And and the soldiers were like betrayed by their command, duped into doing this thing, but they are actually heroes that have been fighting the war and, and whatnot. And he needs that now. Like Prigozhin is dead. The soldiers are there. He needs these soldiers to go fight the wars he wants to, them to fight whether it's in Africa or in Ukraine. Yeah. Um, what do you think currently, I know it's hard to generalize, but uh, how the war is being viewed in Russia? I would think that there are a certain number of people celebrating the fact that the Ukrainian offensive seems so far not to have succeeded, to say the least. Um, and... Uh, on the other hand, you hear that, you know, uh, I mean, a lot of Russians have died and been maimed. Uh, although one service uh, Prigozhin performed for Putin is to ensure that a certain number of those would be convicted felons who uh, will not be so mourned. And in fact, I think in a way, technically don't qualify as casualties in the same sense that Russian soldiers do. Um, the uh, And you're hearing that, you know, uh, on both sides of the lines, it, 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 right now it's not a good place to be. And, you know, the Ukrainian side keeps saying, look, the, the morale could collapse. That's how brutal this thing is. This, that's how much punishment we're inflicting on the Russians uh, on the, uh, along the lines of the offensive and, and so on. Um, so wh what do you have? I know, again, you can't generalize. You're not in Russia, but I'm sure you're uh, keeping in touch with some people there. What's your take on so I'm keeping in touch with people who are there. Also, my wife has been going to Russia every like three, four months and mm -hmm. coming back with uh, impressions. Um, I think the strategy of the authorities has changed and uh, it might be working. So in the early days, cities were uh, covered with these billboards with the letter Z and we, uh, whatever Russians don't leave their own in trouble and we need to support the heroes. And there was this uh, propaganda campaign 
to ramp up the emotional pro-war kind of uh, uh, response. This has changed now. Uh, they put most of these down, and instead it's ads for uh, enlisting into the army with a contract, and you're going to get a lot of money. Uh, and I think that's the change. Uh, I read just a couple of days ago, I haven't really tried to check the sources and figure out whether this is true or not, uh, but uh, the article said that two-thirds of the people fighting in Ukraine now are people serving with a contract, so professional you know, mm-hmm. soldiers who are doing this, who volunteer to do this and are being paid for it. Mm-hmm. So that's a very different, I think, uh, you know, people feel differently about, about deaths of people who chose to go to war right. as opposed to people who were drafted uh, and didn't want to. Um, separately, so my wife just went to Russia recently. She came back like a few weeks ago and her feeling was that she was in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, in Pskov, and in that little village where she, uh, her family has a house. This isn't, uh, so it's not, not Moscow or St. Petersburg, not even Pskov, which is, you know, not the central city. And then uh, there's a, a smaller town between the village and Pskov called Ostrov. So she saw these different locales and they all seem much nicer. And especially the little, little town outside of Pskov. Uh, she said, you know, I've been going there for 15 years or something, and it never looked good. And now there's like renovation. There is, they oh, wait, fixed what? up the, they fixed up. Well, it's just like a, a small depressed town. where. Right, but why is that? Why is that happening? So this is anecdotal. There is not, you know, it's just her impressions, but she f- felt that this is one part of a larger uh, kind of strategy to invest into making life nicer, just the day to day. Like mm-hmm. let's invest into these, uh, uh, you know, local, um, uh, you know, let, let, let's renovate the square, let's renovate the river uh, side, and uh, make fee- people feel that life is getting better. So this war is a part of a larger dynamic within the country of country getting stronger and better. Uh, And then as far as how people are perceiving that, my sense from talking from with like people of my circle and friends of friends and stuff like that is, and also, you know, there are social media or videos that every once in a while there's uh, somebody doing these kind of on TikTok or somewhere they talk to people in the street and they ask them questions. And the main feeling I get from all of these different kinds of people is if you are in Russia and you are not like happy about the war, maybe you're strongly anti-war, maybe you're trying to, you know, not formulate things very starkly, but you would rather there was no war. Uh, people are disengaging and they're focusing on their private lives Mm -hmm. and they don't want to talk. The starkest example of that is actually a very old friend of mine uh, who is anti-war, stayed in Russia. And when the mutiny was happening, I was trying to have a little group chat with a few friends and I was trying to get, because I was like frantically, you know, updating the news feeds and translating things into English to post it psychopolitica. And this was like my whole two days. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was not getting a response from, from my friends in this group chat. It turned out one of them had a hungover, hangover. The other though, the one who stayed in Russia, the only one out of us, uh, got like irritated eventually. Uh, he's like... He's like, I'm, his words were, I'm tired of following this fucking soap opera. Like when, I don't understand if this is a mutiny, like there, there's no civil war right now. He had right. relatives in Rostov. So there are tanks in the city wow. mm-hmm. where his, uh, a part of his family lives. And he takes it like, when there's news, come and talk to me. Yeah. Uh, I'm tired of trying to figure out what is happening. He tried to be afraid of something 
that that like nobody knocked on my door just yet. There's mm-hmm. something happening. Nobody can explain to me what exactly is happening, and I'm supposed to follow this and be afraid. And I'm not going to do that. Yeah. Uh, so this it, this sounds kind of good for Putin. I mean, I mean, the the people who would oppose the war are just more or less accepting it and disengaging. Uh, that's the, my feeling. A lot of people left, uh, and people who stayed, I think it's like a, you know, it's it. it kind of makes sense as a defense like you you live there mm-hmm. you can't really do anything uh navalny was just uh added what 20 years to his sentence strelkov even uh got arrested yeah, this Pregosin is the guy dead. who uh had kind of led spearheaded the russian role in ukraine um at least in the donbass after the crimea uh seizure early on, and he was a nationalist who also had his criticisms of the military, but also didn't like Fergosian. Anyway, I I thought, yeah, interesting that he was arrested. And I wondered whether that was a sign that Putin felt the heat coming from the nationalist right. Although, on the other hand, as you said, he extended Navalny's jail sentence as well. He's he's trying to take care of the heat on both sides, I guess. What what, what were you going to say? Strelkov, sorry to talk more shit like he crossed lines uh in like he talks specifically about putin yeah uh, in very direct terms and it made sense yeah and yes i think there is a constituency that he represents i don't know how large it is but it's more active in a sense than like the anti-war people who are in russia because from there from there you see the the main kind of sentiment they express is I'm trying to do what I can. Like I have a job that helps people in some way, so I'm trying to do that. I have my family that need need to, to care take care of. That's what I'm trying to do. I can't stop this war, so you know what do you want from me? Uh, which is p- fine by Putin, I'm sure. And then uh, the so you think Strelkov, P- if that's his name, he has two names, Gherkin and Strelkov. One of them is a nom de guerre, but yeah. Uh, he, you're saying he represents kind of those people, or did I miss? No, no, no. He's he's the other uh, part okay. that's. I, I'm saying I don't know right. how numerous they are, but they're more active, and you should be more worried about them. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, they're, they're taking of care of control yeah. them. Yeah. yeah, and and those other people have been taken care of. The, you know, Navalny is in jail. Every there's nobody like in Russia who represents the part. Uh, they're either dead or in jail or left the country, so they don't have any leaders, any prominent. Uh, uh, opinion uh, leaders who are still able to live and function within mm-hmm. the country and are not jailed. And um, I guess Strelkov, although there are people, uh, you know, on the on the nationalist right who might otherwise get upset to see him in prison, it sounds to me like you're saying he had gone so far over the line uh, in terms of what he said about Putin that it's hard for them to get all that indignant about the arrest. Yeah, like you're... I mean, it's, again, it's expected. It's like even the... I saw... So when the mutiny started happening, I had to subscribe to a bunch of pro-war Telegram channels because mm-hmm. that's where you could get the information. Right. And I never unsubscribed from a couple because I thought that was, there might be updates. Yeah. Uh, and there was even... Even outside of that, there was something interesting about like getting a window into that world. It's like you're listening to Russians with attitudes. I'm not going to do that, but these Telegram channels, I can do Well, you're it. saying you're not going to go so far as to listen to, to Russians with attitude. That's yeah, even more see, extreme than the Telegram I mean, channels? Or? The Telegram channels, you just scroll through the feed. You you know, you spend a couple of minutes, you get what they're talking about. To listen for a whole hour. While you're like, yeah. Thing. But yeah, anyway, um, so uh, now when Prigozhin was killed, one of the messages I saw that they posted like a photo portrait of the guy and the line was in the Game of Thrones you either win or you die. So there is acceptance. Yeah. Like this was our guy. He yeah. risked. Didn't work out the way he planned. Yeah. They pay respects to him but this is the game. Uh, and so Strelkov uh, didn't play that game well. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, 
So listen, we've been talking almost an hour. And uh, as you know, uh, one thing I've started doing is including like an overtime segment and podcast for paid subscribers to the non-zero newsletter. Let me throw in one, one, one more thing. Sure. Uh, since you asked the question about the, you know, how people are feeling, what are the uh, perspectives there? I gave you a couple, but then there's also, and again, it's hard to say, you know, how many people are that way, but enough for it to be a type uh, and for when, so there, the anecdote, the particular story on my mind is we've got a friend who has never been outside of Russia, except for when she visited us in Armenia last uh -huh. year. And she's been dreaming of going to Paris one day. And so this year she decided I'm going to do it. Yeah. And she told her mother, she didn't even get to say that she's going to France. Uh-huh. Because she said Europe, and after that, her mother was not interested in the details. She was indignant because she's a traitor to her country to plan a tourist trip to Europe when this is the collective West that we are fighting with. Mm -hmm. That kind of pro-Putin, pro-government, pro-war attitude is there too, and it's again common enough for me to not be surprised when I hear this story from this girl, I'm like, oh, yeah, you're, right. you're in this situation. I've heard this situation from other people too. Right. So um, that's just to say that that is there as well. Yeah. Um, so I want to, uh, like, uh, we're going to go into this overtime uh, segment now. I want to talk more about this stuff. I also want to want, want to get your take on the Russians with Attitude guys that uh, I had uh, on my podcast. Talk more about your newsletter, um, Psychopolitica. Uh, talk about psychedelics, I think, which is not unrelated to your newsletter. Um, and uh, I, I, meanwhile, for those who aren't going to be with us, I'd say check out the newsletter. It's uh, Psychopolitica, one word. Uh, Politica is spelled with a C, not a K, even though Nikita right. is Russian. Um, and uh, and I, I assure you it will be unlike almost every Substack newsletter you've ever you've ever seen um and yeah thank you for uh moving your head and letting us see both the psychopolitica sign and the fact that you haven't made your bed nikita is that that's a bedroom couch. behind you oh that's the couch that's okay couch. never mind i take it back I take it back this is this is uh technically my kitchen ah uh, it's just a weird little part of the kitchen nice i like the colors uh i forget what i remember to say at the beginning that you used to work with me here at the Non-Zero Foundation, which puts out the Non-Zero newsletter and the Non-Zero podcast, which, by the way, uh, you know, rate and review, as they say, I don't say that nearly as often as much, but uh, uh, nearly as often as I should, but it does matter. And uh, it helps. And uh, if you want to listen to the rest of this podcast and have a podcast feed that includes all the bonus audio material, uh, which includes all the overtime segments and some podcasts that aren't in the public feed at all. Not to mention uh, a certain amount of printed material in the newsletters behind a paywall. Uh, just go to non-zero, uh, Google non-zero and Substack, or um, click the link in the show notes of this podcast in your podcast app. Go there. Uh, after you do that, you'll see a post for this podcast. And if you want to set up the podcast feed and not just listen to uh, at uh, at to this episode at that moment, but set up the podcast feed. Uh, you click the listen on thing in the in the pod in that post or any audio post uh, at the in the non zero newsletter and there are instructions for setting up the podcast feed with an RSS code. Anyway, thanks everybody who's been with us so far. And now uh, we are going into overtime.